Hello everyone, my name is Austin Shaner, and welcome back to my channel. As early as my first video, I have been getting constant requests for cam tutorials on guitars. I started off this cam series with a simple gift box design, so that way we could cover more of the fundamentals like setting up your stock, your tools, the differences between 2D and 3D toolpaths, and what options are available in each. In the second part, we talked about order of operations, which is basically a thought exercise on analyzing various constraints a particular design might bring and how you might need to order your tool paths so you end up with a successful program. If you haven't watched those videos or are just getting started with CAM, I highly recommend you watch them first because they will go into much greater detail about how these tools work so that everything I'm gonna be talking about in this video will make a lot more sense. So today, we're finally going to be programming the cam for my guitar body that I created in previous videos. If you'd like to see how I modeled that guitar, you can check out my six part series on my channel. Links to all these videos will be in the descriptions below. Fair warning, this is going to be a pretty long video. So if you'd like to skip ahead, timestamps will be in the description below. But let's not waste any more time and get started. Okay, so first things first, let's take a second to analyze this body and understand some of the constraints we're going to need to pay attention to as we're programming the cam. So the order of operations here. Constraint number one is that we have a laminated top with some hidden features underneath. So if I hide the laminated top, you can see that we have some wiring raceways or channels that we're going to need to mill out before we actually glue on the laminated top. So that means that we're going to have to pre-machine those and as far as the cam is concerned, we're, that means we're going to have two separate size stocks. So one, one without the laminated top and one with the laminated top. Constraint number two is that we have a two-sided design, meaning that we know at some point we're going to have to machine one side of the part, flip it over, and machine the other side of the part. And that presents some pretty unique challenges because that means we have to provide a way to not only align and hold on to our part, but also maintain our work offsets in both orientations. So that is a pretty tall order, and I will go into more detail in a moment about how I decided to tackle that. Constraint number three is that we have tapered and non-parallel surfaces. So you can see these belly cuts here. If we look at it from this angle, they don't come parallel to the top surface. So that means that we know that we're gonna have to utilize some 3D roughing strategies and as well as following up with some 3D finishing strategies, possibly with a ball nose end mill at some point, which means ultimately that we're going to have at least one or two tool changes, possibly more throughout the operation. And lastly, constraint number four, since my CNC particularly doesn't have a vacuum wasteboard, we need a way to hold on to that part as that final operation cuts around the perimeter, um, because that way our, we don't want our part to break free and run into the bit and end up ruining all the hard work we just did. So there's a couple of different ways to tackle this. You can use double-sided tape on the bottom of the part. Um, you can use effectively the same method but with blue tape and super glue, which is a pretty common way of holding parts down. And then you can also use tabs, which I will show you guys in the cam. But essentially that leaves a little, a little bit of material left over at certain intervals so that way you don't fully cut through. And then after you're done machining, you can just break those parts off and sand it down flush. So the way I've chosen to solve most of these constraints is to use a simple fixture and two separate size stocks, one without the laminated top and one with the laminated top. Let me quickly show you how I designed those. Um, I'm not going to be modeling them with you, but I'll show you some of the core features, and then we'll start programming the toolpaths. So jumping into the design workspace, let me go ahead and hide our bodies and the laminated top, and then let's bring up the stock and I'll hide the fixture. So I created this stock by projecting in the boundary sketch, let's hide that real quick, the boundary sketch from my original body sketch. And what that does is that represents the outermost regions of the body that I know I need to have at minimum enough stock for. So I projected that into a sketch for my stock, and then I created a boundary that was one and a half inches on the front and back to give me enough room for some dowel pins that will hold our alignment during the machining. And then a half inch border on the sides 
just to give myself a little bit of breathing room in case I don't have it perfectly aligned or anything on my fixture. So then I just simply, let me pull that up. I just ex simply extruded that to the surface that I needed. So the thickness of my guitar body without the laminated top and called it a day. Then I repeated literally that exact same process for stock number two. The only difference is that I gave it a larger height, an extra quarter of an inch on top to accommodate the uh, laminated top. So let's go ahead and hide that. And then my computer's being a little slow. And then let's bring up our fixture. So what I did was for the fixture, the first sketch, what I did was I projected in the outer profile of my stock. So that way I knew, okay, basically the same process as the stock. I knew that I needed to have at least enough material to cover the width of the stock. And then I gave myself an extra two inches on each side. So that way I give enough room for my tool to be able to come in and zero on the corners and also gave me enough room to include dowel pins for my fixture. And so those dowel pins will go through my fixture into my wasteboard and lock that in place in X and Y. And so that way, if I ever want to come back and remachine this part at a later date, as long as I still have those dowel holes on my wasteboard, I can just drop this fixture back onto my wasteboard and start machining. So let me hide that real quick. And I just simply extruded that up by half an inch. Hold on. Yep, okay. And then I cut in a little recess. So I created a little quarter inch recess right here, which tells me that when I put the stock onto the fixture, um, I just need to cover that boundary. So I just need to cover this line right here, this inner, this inner line. And that tells me that I am clear and I've covered the entire portion that may or may not get machined during these operations. And so I know I have enough stock covering my fixture to be okay. And then what I did was after that, I applied a fillet on three corners, um, here, here, and here. And I intentionally did that because I did not apply it to one corner, which tells me that this is the corner all of my programs are going to zero off of. So when I take my end mill, when I set it up in my CNC, I will zero off of this corner, this corner, and I will actually zero my uh, programs to the actual top of the fixture rather than the top of the stock. Because what, what I chose to do was actually, when I put the stock onto the fixture, it will have a very specified thickness. So I'm gonna do some pre-machining and facing down my, my stock so that it's the thickness that my fixture needs. And so that way I never have to zero off the top of the stock. I can just zero directly off of the fixture itself. Now, obviously this is not the only way to do this. There are a lot of other good ways to be able to flip your parts and maintain your work offsets, etc. The reason I chose to do this is a couple constraints that I have personally. So I don't have a joiner or a thickness planer. I just have my CNC and a table saw. And my table saw is a little cheap one from Home Depot, and I can't accurately produce 90 degree angles on my cuts. No matter how much I calibrate it, it always wobbles just a little bit. And so if I don't have a perfectly, you know, perpendicular or 90 degree square cut on the sides of my stock, then that means whenever I go to flip it over, if I'm zeroing off of my stock rather than somewhere else, I'm going to introduce an error in my measurement. And so I might be a 32nd of an inch off or possibly worse. So basically I'm, I'd be off by the amount that my table saw blade drifted. And so what's nice about this is I've divorced my work offsets from my stock. And I've instead made them relative to my dowel pins and my fixture rather than my stock. So it actually doesn't matter if my stock extends way off here or is too long, too short, etc. As long as it's covering this portion right here, I will always be good because I'm zeroing my work offsets off a known point on my wasteboard and both on X, Y, and Z. So all that matters to me is that it's covering this area and it's the right thickness, which I have full capabilities of doing in my home shop. And so this works really great for me. It might not work great for you. This might be, not be the best solution for you, 
but I've had really good results with this and it's pretty plug and play. So the last thing we're going to do before we set up our stock and program the tool paths for this guitar, let's go ahead and jump into the manufacturing workspace and set up a couple of the tools that we know we're going to use to machine this guitar. Um, a lot of you guys have asked me for tutorials on how to set up tools. Um, I'm not going to go super in depth here, but I, sh I should be able to give you enough information here that you should be able to program at least the basic tools. So the last thing we're going to do before we program any of our tool paths for our guitar is to go ahead and set up some of the tools or the end mills that we're going to use to go ahead and uh, machine this guitar. So jump into the manufacturing workspace and come up to here and hit tool library. So this is where you can pick your end mills that you want to use to simulate and generate your tool paths. Um, Autodesk thankfully has a ton of available tools already ready to use and full transparency, I generally use the automatically generated ones from the Fusion 360 library. Because typically I'm just using this to simulate um, the operation, so, so as long as I have a end mill with the correct diameter, that usually works for me. But a lot of you guys have requested that I include some information on how to set up end mills in here, so I'm going to go ahead and do that for you. So there's three main sections of the tool library. There's your document library, your local library, and the Fusion 360 library. Obviously the Fusion 360 one is the already provided ones from Autodesk. The local library is a permanent library saved on your computer. So no matter what design you're in, if you're, program if you're jumping from one guitar to another guitar that you're designing, you still have access to these tools. And the document library is where I'm gonna set up specific tools just for this file or design alone. So generally you won't set up things in here unless you're only using one bit that's exclusive to this, uh, to this operation. So what I would recommend you do is if you're going to create your own tools is go to your local library and then you can pick um, just general library or you can create a new library under whatever name you want. So if I go into my local library and I hit the plus sign, I can then choose the type of end mill that we're going to be putting in here. So there's ball end mills, bull nose, flat end mills, face mills, etc. You can get countersinks or dovetails. Pick the one that is close most closely represents the type of tool you're trying to put in. So sometimes I run into issues when I'm creating like a countersink one when really I just want like a V groove bit or something. So oftentimes I'll end up using an, et, an engrave or a chamfer mill or something like that. But for this operation, we're going to be using a quarter inch flat down cut end mill. We're going to be using an eighth inch flat up cut end mill and we're going to use a quarter inch round bull nose, or sorry, not bull nose, ball nose um, upcut end mill. So let's go ahead and add our flat end mill. And in here you can put descriptions or where you purchase it from or anything like that. So that way you can come back and say, okay, where did I get that before? You can go to cutter, and this is where you define the geometry of the end mill. So I can go flat end mill, you can come back in here and change it. So even if you accidentally clicked something else and you want to use a different type, you can still change it in there. So flat end mill, cutter, and I'm going to keep it at flat end mill and are using inches or millimeters. In this case, I'm using inches because I bought these locally in, this, in the States. Is it a clockwise or counterclockwise spinning end mill? In this case, it's clockwise, which is the standard. How many flutes does it have? So how many cutting edges? So in most cases, I think most of our router bits that we have are two flutes. Sometimes they're three and occasionally one. So let's do number of flutes is two. What's the material? And you can use high-speed steel, uh, titanium coated, carbide, ceramics, etc. Most of ours are carbide. You might run into some high-speed steel ones, but most of them are carbide. And then in the geometry tab, you've got the main diameter here. So the cutting diameter that is different than the shaft diameter, because occasionally you will have a, let's say a half inch shaft with a quarter inch cut. So you, you can change those separately, but otherwise it's generally the same. So we can go 0.25 and you can see it's automatically changed to 0.25 because it's referencing the tool diameter. Now, if you did have a half inch shank, 
but at quarter inch flutes, you can override that and go like 0.125. Or, uh, sorry, that's I did it backwards. So 0.5, let's say, and 0.25. So I have a half inch shank and a quarter inch cutting area. But in this case, it's the same. So 0.25. And then the overall length is from the tip of the flutes all the way to the back of the shank. So in this case, I'm going to do 2 inches. And then the length below the holder is how, basically, it's trying to figure out how much of that bit are you holding on to. So you take whatever your overall length is minus how much you're holding on to. So if I'm going to hold on to a half of inch, half, sorry, half inch of it, I can type in 1.5. And then the shoulder length is typically, this usually only matters when you've got a different size shaft versus flutes. Um, so I typically leave it the same as my length, or sorry, my flute length. So I'm going to type in 0.75 and 0.75. So that way my shaft is the same length as my flutes. And then in here, you can add a shaft. Sorry, shaft is used two different ways here. You can add a different type of collet, shaft, holder, etc. We're not going to do that in our case. We don't need it. Same with the holder. We don't need to add that. Cutting data. This is where you can set the feeds and speeds that you want this tool to be associated with. So if you always want this tool to use the same feeds and speeds, then you can go ahead and type these in here. So we can type a uh, spindle speed of 16,000 RPM. That's the bottom range of my router. So I tend to do that because I can always speed it up if it's cutting too aggressively. Uh, you don't need to type in surface speed, ramp spindle speed. So as it's ramping down, do you want that spindle speed to be different? In my case, no. So I'm just going to type 16,000 RPM. Cutting feed rate. Now, obviously, feeds and speeds are a very large topic, so I don't have time to cover what's the correct cutting feed rate. So I'm just going to show you guys what I would typically use for mine. So I'm going to do 75 inches per minute. Sometimes I will increase that depending on what I'm cutting. Uh, feed per two, so that is generated off of the cutting feed rate and the spindle RPM. So at 16,000 RPM and 75 inches per minute, I will be cutting two and a Basically, basically two and a half thousandths per revolution of each flute. So each flute will cut two and a half thousandths. So I can actually go a little bit higher than that, and I can probably go like 90. And then I can always speed it up if I need to. So we'll do 90 inches per minute. Ramp feed rate. So I'm going to bring this up to about 40. That's roughly what I use. Uh, lead in feed rate, lead out feed rate. That again is. As the tool is entering my stock, do I want it to move really slowly and then pick up speed once it's cutting? Or do I just want to, you know, go right, bowl right into it? So I'm just going to go ahead and leave that the same. You can override that if you want. Uh, plunge feed rate. So that's how fast is your Z axis moving as it's going into your stock. So you typically want this at for my own rule is I want it a third of whatever my cutting feed rate is, but it can oft it can generally be pretty low. So we'll do 30 inches per minute. And then um, you can specify a step down if you want or a step over. Generally, I don't do that because those change frequently from toolpath to toolpath. So I tend to leave that, um, I tend to leave those unchecked. And then coolant, if you don't have coolant enabled on your CNC machine, you can just go ahead and hit disabled. If you do have coolant, you do have the choice of flood, mist, air, etc. And generally in wood, we don't use any coolant, so you can typically leave this disabled. Um, but if you have that feature available, you might want to um, have it default to disabled, but you can always change it later. And then post processor, you can tell it, uh, you can basically give it some extra constraints of how you want it to post process in the G code. So you can tell it um, basically how long as of the tool will be sticking out. Um, what's the actual tool number. So if you have an automatic tool changer, it will automatically program to switch to that tool. In this case, we don't really care, so we can just hit accept. And now we've got that in there. 
In fact, I'm going to change the name of that real quick to guitars quarter inch flat. Hit accept. So that way it, it differentiates from the ones I already have in here. And then we're just going to run through this real quickly and do our eighth inch ones as well. So we'll do flat end mill, cutter, flat end mill, inches, number of flutes is two, carbide, diameter is 0.125, shaft diameter is 0.125 as well, overall length in this case is 1.5 inches, length below the holder is one inch, shoulder length is 0.75 and 0.75. Hit OK. I'm going to edit that as well. I forgot to do that. Guitars, eighth inch flat. Hit accept. Okay, and now we can do a ball nose one as well. So let's go ahead and hit the plus sign again. Ball end mill. Cut. Let's change this to guitars, ball, or quarter inch ball. Cutter, ball, inches, yep, number of flutes, it's two flutes. Carbide again. Diameter is 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Overall length is two and a half inches in my case. Length below the holder. So I know that I'm not going to use that entire two and a half inches of that tool, so I'm going to choke up on it a bit. And I'm going to say the length below the holder is one and a half inches. So I'm holding on to an inch of that tool. Shoulder length <clears throat> is 0.5 and 0.5. I've got a pretty stubby little cutting portion on there. Um, I do have a longer one if we run into any errors in our cam, so I might come back and change that. Hit accept. And now we've got our three tools, and now those will be available for us in all of our programs. Now that all of that is out of the way, let's go ahead and close out of our tool library and let's create our first setup so we can start uh, programming the tool paths for the wiring channels that will be hidden underneath the laminated top. So let's go to setups, new setup. You can see it's already kind of picked one for me, but we might need to change that. So let's bring our models in over here. And let's say our stock. Well, first of all, let's choose our model. Let's show our bodies. Now we only want this. We don't want the laminated top as well. So we only want the main body. And then our work coordinate system. If we go select X, Y axes, then I can select X axis is here and Y axis is here. Now right now it's centered to the middle. So I'm going to say I want that to be, um, the origin point is over here. Now sometimes it want so it'll what, what it will want you to do is pick something off of the stock. So what I can actually do is change this from origin or change this origin from model origin to selected point or from stock box point to selected point. And now I'm free to pick anything in within my setup. So I can say I want it to start here and not on my stock. And then I can take the x-axis and flip it to the other side of the origin point. So check that. So Y is going in the correct direction, X is and Z is, so we are good there. And then in stock, we can go from solid, and then we can choose our stock model. So right now you can see that it auto-detected the stock that has the laminated top, but we don't actually want that. So let's show our stock, and we will choose this one right here. So this is the shorter stock that doesn't have the laminated top, so we're good there. Let's double check our heights. I think perspective is on. There we go. Okay. So yeah, you can see that it lines up just fine. So that's good. And then down here, I can say fixture. And I can then choose my fixture. The, the way Fusion utilizes the fixture is it basically, when you're simulating your tool paths, it will detect whether or not your bit is slamming into your fixture and it will throw an error. So that's kind of nice because if I set something wrong where I set it to plunge too deep, 
it'll detect that, hey, it's ramming right into your fixture, and it will throw an error for me, and then I can go back and fix it. So that's great. Hit OK. And now we've got our setup. So our first operation is going to be a 2D contour. So I'll come up here to 2D, 2D contour, and we're going to use this to machine the little um, channels for the wiring. Now I could have done a pocket, so let me hide the stock. I could do a pocket and machine this entire area down from the top down, but I'm going to end up cutting this profile anyway for the pickups when the laminated top is on, so I don't want to double up on the effort because really all we care about is that these slots are milled. So I'm going to go ahead and do a 2D contour. And then let's select our tool. So we'll go to the library that we created earlier and pick our quarter inch flat. Hit select. And you can see all the settings that I put in there is already ready for me. So I don't need to make any changes. And then on the geometry tab. Now it's going to try to pick a chain, right? So if I hover over this, it's going to try to pick everything in that area. So what what you can do is if you hold the Alt key, you can pick individual portions of that contour rather than having to select the entire thing. So now I can just come up while holding the Alt key and select this line and that one. And then I can keep holding Alt and select this one and that one. And then let's just hit OK and see what happens. And let's bring our bring our stock back never mind <laughs> sorry there we go that's what I was looking for okay so by doing that you can see that it's just gonna plunge all the way down to the bottom and cut and so we we actually need to come back and change it to multiple depths and also it's not extending far out into this er area which means that if I come back later and cut this, I might not have cleared out that entire slot as much as I need. So what I'm going to end up doing actually is create what's called the tangential, it's a hard word to say, extension, which basically extends this tool path out a little bit further than the actual geometry that we selected. So if I right click my 2D contour, hit edit, and I go back to the geometry tab, right under contour selection is tangential extension. Basically, that says how far off of the toolpath do you want the, the cutter to extend. And I can do equal on all lines, or I can do unique ones for each line. So I'm just going to do equal for all lines and go off an extra quarter of an inch. So if I hit OK, you can see that now my toolpath is slightly longer than it was before. So it's going to actually breach into these cavities a little bit better. So now we need to come back and select our heights. So we want it to go down to the selected contours, which is fine. Or we could say selection. We want it to go down to this face. Let's just go ahead and do that. Let's check our top height. So our top height is from stock top, which is what we want in this case, because our stock right now isn't taller than our model. And we can leave clearance height and retract height the same. And then go to passes. And we want so we got the finishing feed rate. Where's our step over? Actually, because this is a contour on, uh, contouring operation, there is no step over. So what we're going to end up doing, because we want to cut in, we want to start in the middle and do it in two passes. So we can do multiple finishing passes. And number of finishing passes is two. And how much do we want it to step over? We'll step over an eighth of an inch. OK. And then in multiple depths we can go uh, maximum roughing step down. So how much in Z do I want it to take off at any given time? So I'm going to say an eighth of an inch and take off rough vinyl. And then we don't want any stock to leave um, because we're not going to have any other top opportunity later to come back and machine this. So we're just going to cut right to the boundary. And then we don't need to change anything in here. Hit OK. And so now you can see that we've got it cutting in one, two, three, four passes in Z and two passes in XY. So let's simulate that real quick. Now I like to use this colorization comparison because it actually shows me 
what is stock and what is model even if I don't have my model showing so eventually once it gets to actually cutting my model it'll start turning those surfaces green so let's play that again a little bit slower so it's going to come in and cut and then expand out and start touching the model and that's going to turn green which means yes we are in contact with the model so great we went all the way all the way to the wall let's speed this up a little bit Okay, and then it's going to do the same thing for this one. And yes, we reached the bottom surface showing because it's showing green. So we are good there, and we have extended into this cavity. So now we can go ahead and close that out. And let's machine most of this uh, control cavity. Since we're already here and we cut it down, let's go ahead and just machine at least most of the way down. So let's go 2D Adaptive Clearing. And let's select our tool. Looks like this one is already selected, our, the one we made earlier. Hit OK. Geometry. So what pocket are we selecting? We want it to cut. Now if I select this top line, you can see it's going to end up selecting the entire um, pickup slot. So we don't want that. So I'm going to select this bottom one. And then we will tell it the distance we want it to cut down to. So let's go ahead and go to Heights. And we want it to go down to selected contours, which is that bottom ring right here. Let me hide my fixture. If we look on the bottom, you can see that I have a recess here. So I actually selected that line because I'm going to end up cutting all this, um, all this area anyway later on for the recess. So we're only going to go down that far. And then in my Heights tab, yep from stock top to that contour we're good there passes so do we want any stock to leave in this case no we don't because we're not getting another another opportunity to machine some of this and then optimal load so how much of my cutter is engaged in the material at any given time I'm gonna leave that at point one uh, it's generally best to use less than half of your bit if you're using this strategy um, if you've got a particularly rigid machine, you can really plow into it and use most of your bit. I have a, you know, a bit of a wimpy X-carve, so I tend to only use less than half my bit. And then multiple depths, I'm going to cut down in 1 8 inch increments. And that should be good. Let's hit OK and see what happens. And let's simulate both of these together and see what we got for this setup. Okay, so yep, it's cutting there. Now it's going to clear out in 1 8 inch depth increments through this pocket. I'll speed it up a little bit all the way down. All the way down until that little recess on the back, which we're going to end up carving out later. And that whole process right there takes 14.54, or not 14.54, 14 minutes and 54 seconds. So that's a pretty good cycle time. So we're going to end up doing that. And now we're going to, if in real life, what would happen is now that's been cleared out. Now it's given me an opportunity to go ahead and glue on my laminated top so that I can continue machining from the top of the laminated top. So what we can do is actually come to this setup that we just created and hit duplicate. So that way we don't have to redo all this effort. So we can go duplicate. And now we have another setup. So let's name it something. So let's go laminated top one. And this will be pre-laminated top. And then in here, let's go ahead and edit our setup. Most of this should stay the same. The main difference here is that we're going to change our models and we're going to change our stock. So in here, instead of using that stock, I'm going to grab the other stock that was a little taller and we're going to select that one. So now it's about a quarter of an inch taller, as you can see here. And then in my setup, Right now it only has this body selected, but I also now want to have the laminated top. So let me show my laminated top. And if I hold control, 
on my keyboard, I can select that as well. So now I have two bodies that it's going to detect and be able to cut through. So hit OK. And so now my setup is updated for my laminated top. And so now what we can do is start cutting the pickup slots. So let's go ahead and select the new setup, switch over to that, and now let's do a 2D adaptive clearing again. And we're going to select, let's hide our stock over here. There we go. Select this contour and this contour, making sure that it's on the inside, not the outside. And that's it for the geometry tab. Let's double check that our tool is still the correct tool. Yep, we're still using the quarter inch flat, so we haven't re zeroed our work, so work offsets at all yet or done any tool changes. Go to our heights and let's say selection, we want it to go down to this face. And then in the passes, let's hide that. There we go. Hold on, I'm going to hit OK real quick and get rid of that. So these two we want to delete because we're not going to use them. Go back and edit. Okay. So optimal load, we're still going to keep 0.1 inches. Multiple depths, we're going to go ahead and do 0.125 inches as a maximum roughing step down. And then we're actually going to leave a little bit of stock. So I'm going to leave a 32nd of an inch radially, so going a, um, around the bit, but not on the bottom of the bit. And then the axial stock, we're going to leave zero. So that way it will cut all the way down to the very bottom of the stock or not the stock, all the way down to the bottom of that face, but it's going to leave a little bit on the sides. And then we're good in here, so we don't need to change anything in here unless we want it to enter from a specific position. So we might come back and look at that. Hit OK. Let's see what it does. So this is looking pretty good. It's starting here. We could, if we wanted this bit to start directly in the middle, we could totally change that. Um, and I can show you how to do that real quick. So if I pull up my sketches and I pull up the sketch for my pickup slots, where are they? There they are. And I come back to this in the linking tab over here, I can say entry positions. And so I can select that and then I can choose a specific point where the program needs to start cutting at. And so I can select like both of these two points and hit OK. And you can see, let me hide the sketches again, that now the helix ramp is now starting directly in the middle of that slot. And so we'll just go ahead and leave it like that. So now we can go ahead and cut the main perimeter of our body to give ourselves some clearance so we can cut the neck pocket and we can start using a roughing strategy for some of those tapered surfaces. So let's go ahead and create 2D contour. And then in the geometry tab, let's double check. Yep, we still have our guitar's quarter inch bit, so we're good there. In the geometry tab, this is where probably a lot of people get tripped up on because it's really hard to select specific features. Like I want to cut around this. Well, there's a really easy trick. If you're not using a 3D adaptive strategy, which would automatically detect what you want to cut, a really easy um, trick is to pull up your sketch of your body. And you can use that as your cutting profile. So I can say, I want that to be the contour I want it to cut. And then you can say, well, how far down do I want it to cut that? And actually, I need to switch it to the other side. So it's cutting to the outside of that line, not the inside. And then I can go bottom height, and let's do from stock top, how far down do we want it to cut? So let's see, let's do 0.75, oh, negative 0.75 from the top of the stock. So that's going to cut down that far. Now, if I want it to cut directly down to the middle, I think it would be 0.8125, yes. So let's say we wanted to cut down to the middle of the stock. We could select it like that. And then top height is still stock top. Everything else we can basically leave the same unless you want to specify it. And then we want multiple finishing passes because 
We don't want to just plunge our bit around and around and around until it's down. We actually want to preferably only cut on one side of the bit as much as possible. That will lessen the load on your tool, but it will also increase the width of that slot. So as you go deeper into the slot, your, your bit's not just sitting there rubbing up against the sidewalls. So we can actually basically expand the slot by doing this. So number of finishing passes, and we'll step over an eighth of an inch. And let's say we want multiple depths of, in this case, because I'm going to be plunging it first, let's go ahead and do 16th of an inch at a time. Take off rough final. Hit OK, and let's see what happens. Let's hide these sketches. So you can see that it's doing two passes. So it's doing one on this line, and then it's going to step in a little bit further and cut one on this line. And so that made our slot width effectively wider. So let's go ahead and simulate these two so far and see what it does. Hide our sketches. So it's going to start cutting into the pickup slots. Speed this up a little bit until it eventually reaches the bottom. Now you'll notice, because we left some stock to leave, it still left a little bit of blue material here. So we're going to have to come back and clean that up. And I actually forgot to add that. So we'll do that in a second. And so now it's coming around the contour. Everything's staying blue because it's not touching the sidewalls yet. And then. Looks like we got some error message over here, so we'll take a look at this in a second. Okay. Let's say stop at collision and press play. Let's see what happens. So that error message is saying shaft collides with stock. So what that's telling me is that the cutting length, so the actual length of the flutes, isn't long enough to reach down here without the shaft rubbing up against this sidewall. Now, that might not be a huge problem in this case because we're dealing with wood. In metal, that'd probably be a big problem, but there is an easy way to fix this, and that's just to use a bit that has a longer cutting length. So if I hit close and I go back to my tool library, and let's go to the library we created earlier and the quarter inch flat. Let's go and hit edit tool. And let's change it so that we have a flute length of one inch. And that also means that we're going to have to purchase one that has a flute length of one inch. So let's hit OK. And let's re-simulate this and see what happens. So let's regenerate the tool path now that we have a different tool. Okay, and let's re-simulate it and see what happens. See if we still get that error message. It looks like we do. So let me take a look at that. Okay, so I took a second to troubleshoot what was happening there, and actually, I did the correct thing. The problem was I edited the wrong tool. So I edited the, I edited the one that was already in my library, not the one we created before. So now it should be good. Let's go ahead and simulate this real quick cutting through the pickups all the way to the end and it's no longer colliding because I edited the correct tool. So we just need to ha we just need to have a tool that has at least one inch of flute length and then, then we'll be fine. So let's go ahead and add one little uh, cleaning operation here to clean up that path because right now you can see that it's not actually breaching into the hole there. So let's go derived so we can go 2D contour, right click that Oh, I need to get out of simulate. Right click, create, come on. Right click, create derived operation, 2D milling, 2D contour. Then in geometry, let's unselect this and let's select these two slots. Make sure they're both on the inside of that. So we're good there. Heights, we want to go down to that surface and take off this offset that was from the other operation. So it's type zero. And then in heights, we don't want any multiple finishing passes because it's already been all cleared out for us. And then in multiple depths, because I don't want to 
plunge my bit into it the entire depth. I think that's three quarters of an inch. So we'll divide that in half. So let's go 0.375 so it does it in two passes. Hit OK. Safe distance is higher than the feed height. Hit no. Let's see. Safe distance is 0.25. Let's do 0.125. There we go. OK. Hit OK and see what happens. So it's giving me two passes here to clean that up. And we can actually drag that in right above the contour that we just did. So if we simulate this again, it's going to cut through all of these first, leaving a little bit of a stock radially. And then it's going to come back in two passes and clean that up until it's finally at its full width. That. Cleaning up, and then it's going to move on and start cutting the contour all the way around. So we are good there. So now we have cleared out enough information, or not information, enough stock to be able to cut our neck cavity and to start the roughing, um, the 3D roughing tool path to, for these tapered surfaces. So to cut the neck pocket, let's go ahead and do one more 2D adaptive clearing. Uh, the tool, let's make sure it's the correct tool. Yep, okay. In geometry, we're going to select this pocket. Now you'll notice that it's extending all the way out the amount that it wants to cut. And if I flip it to the other side, it's cutting off the rest of our body. So that presents a problem because we don't necessarily want to cut directly over top of our dowel pinhole. So we need to limit that to only cut around this contour. So there's a feature here called stock contours, right? Because right now, what basically what this is telling me is that it needs to remove all the material from the stock into that pocket. But actually, because we just did that entire um, contour around the whole body, we've got a nice gap there for our tool to come into. So we can limit the amount of stock that it's removing to a certain area. So if I check stock contours, Right now it has my whole stock selected, so that's where the toolpath is generating from because this is an open pocket. Since this is an open pocket, it can't just start right here. It has to start from the edge of the stock. So if we bring up our body sketch and we select this as our stock contour, basically what this does is it limits the amount of stock that's being removed to within this boundary. So it can only remove material within this boundary. So then we can just go heights down to this surface. And then we can let's check our top is yes, from stock top. So we're good there. And then stock to leave. Do we want any in this case? No. Actually, yes. Let's go ahead and do that because we'll do a finishing pass to clean that up. So let's do 30 second of an inch radially and zero axially. And then multiple depths. So let's do this in 0.125 increments. And then both ways. So in my CAM basics video, I showed you guys that the bit can cycle zigzag back and forth rather than only climb cutting or only conventional cutting. And then the optimal load will still be 0.1. We hit OK. And so you can see what's happening there. So let's simulate, simulate just that real quick. So this is the blue area here is still leftover base stock. Oh, that went way too fast. Okay, so it's coming in from the outside. Let's angle it this way so you can see a little better. There we go. So it's starting from the outside in because we limited the stock contour. If we didn't limit the stock contour, it would have started out here and zigzagged its way in. So we get all the way to the bottom, so now it's touching the bottom surface, so that's turned green. But you can see that the sidewall here is still blue. So just a second. Okay, so now we just need to come back in like we did with the other one and clean that up. So let's hit close. And let's go ahead and take this cleaning up operation, and let's just duplicate that. So come down here, drag it below. This adaptive. Hold on, sorry. Okay, so now we just need to change what we're cutting. 
So let's come here, change our contour to this contour right here. And then in our Heights tab, we don't want to cut down to that face. We want to cut down to this face. So let's change that to that face. And we've already got the 0.375 from the previous one, and our step overs and everything is still the same. No stock to leave. Hit OK. And so it's going to come in. Let's simulate these two. Let's see. Let's drag that down one. So let's simulate these two together. You can see what it's going to do. It's going to cut this pocket. Once it reaches the bottom, it's going to come back in two passes and clean up that sidewall. And then we're good. Now everything is green. We've reached the bottom of that. So now we can go ahead and do our roughing strategy for this 3D contour. Okay, so let's set up the roughing strategy for these belly cuts. So I can come up to 3D Adaptive Clearing. And I kind of talked about this a little bit in my getting into cam series or getting started with cam series where 2D adaptive clearing, you typically select what you want it to cut, where 3D adaptive clearing, it tries to cut everything, and then you kind of limit it the, with a boundary of what you don't want it to cut. So what we're going to do here is go into the geometry tab. Let's turn off rest machining and stock contours. We want to pull up our sketch again and select that. So it's not trying to remove all the stock around here, just only within that boundary. And then I can come into heights. And in the model or in the bottom height, we can go from stock top down about 0.75 inches. And then in passes, turn off machine cavities because that way it might try to machine these pockets or machine over them. In this case, we don't want it to do that, so turn that off. And then maximum roughing step down. I'm only going to allow it to step down a 16th of an inch. 0 0.065 and I'm changing the same for the fine step down because this is just a real rough strategy. I'm not trying to get any detail here. I'm just trying to clear away most of the material so that way our ball and mill can take care of all that fine work. And then stock to leave. <clears throat> we want to leave a 32nd of an inch. And the reason why is because we don't want to cut all the way down to that face and leave little ridges in the surface. We just want to get again get rid of most of the material. So our ball end mill can do the rest of the work. Uh, optimal load will still stay 0.1. Uh, and I don't think we need to change anything else. No, we need to, do want to cut both ways. And that should be good. So let's hit OK. And let's see what that looks like. OK, so I did, make, I did mess up one little thing. So it's trying to cut that pocket again because it's an open pocket. So it still detects that that's kind of part of the surface. So if I come back and hit edit in stock contours, I can also select that inner edge right there. And so it'll select everything between this one and this one. Hit OK. Let's check again. Give it a second to load. Okay, so it's no longer cutting that pocket. And let's go ahead and simulate this again. I'll speed it up. I'm just going to cut these, then clean them up, then cut that contour, then cut the main neck pocket, clean it up. And now it's trying to, you can see what it's doing. So it's leaving these steps, these little ridges. Let's make this transparent. And let's hide our bodies. So it's going to leave these little ridges, and what we're going to end up doing is with the ball end mill, it's going to end up coming and cleaning most of those off. We just didn't want our ball end mill to have to remove like three quarters of an inch in one go, right? It's only just going to be chipping away whatever's left from those steps. And so that should be good. Let's turn transparency back on and see what we got. So because we didn't go down to the surface and we left stock to leave, this isn't green yet. But that will be green once we come in with our ball end mill. So let's go ahead and set that up. Okay, so for the finishing strategy um, for the tapered surfaces with the ball end mill, I personally prefer to use scallop, which means it's going to basically going to work its way around from the outside to the inside, slowly whittling away everything. 
I've seen a lot of people be very successful with like a contour or a parallel strategy. In fact, you see parallel a lot. Um, but in the case, every time I've tried to do it, I've always gotten the best results with scallops. So that's the one I'm going to show you, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only correct approach. So let's go ahead and do scallop. And we need to change our tool this time. So we need to go to the ball end mill. Let's go to ball. Hit OK. And then in the geometry tab, uh, machining boundary, we want to be silhouette because basically what that does is it's kind of like stock contours that we were doing in the previous operations where it's basically going to project the outer profile of the guitar and it's going to use that as its boundary. So that's what silhouette does. So keep it as silhouette and tool containment. We want the tool to be able to go outside the boundary, but only by its own diameter. We can't. The tool can't go beyond its own diameter outside of the boundary when we do this. So tool outside boundary. And then we want to enable contact point boundary. So what this means is that the center of the tool can go past that boundary um, all the way, basically like what I just said. So it can actually roll over the edges instead of being stuck on the center line. So we can go ahead and contact point boundary. And then we can go avoid touch surfaces so this is going to allow us to specify any surfaces we don't want it to touch so we don't want it to machine anything on the top and we also don't want it to machine this open pocket it's not going to automatically grab these ones because these are closed pockets but because this is an open pocket it might detect that so we want to tell it don't machine that or anything on this flat surface and then we can go to heights and go from stock top same thing as before negative 0.75 inches and then in the passes tab so this step over is how fine this is how you set how fine of a resolution you want this to go so the finer you set this so the smaller the number you set this the better the surface quality you'll get but it'll get drastically longer and longer and longer to machine because it's just going to be whittling its away. You know, if you set it to 10 thousandths of an inch, it's going to do 10 thousandths of an inch pass passes, and it might take you two hours or more to cut that. So I'm going to set that to 1 32nd of an inch, and we'll see if how long the machining time on that is, and maybe we want to increase it. Um, one side note is you can get away with larger step overs if you use a larger ball end mill. And the problem with my machine is I can only use quarter inch bits. So I could theoretically use a quarter inch bit with like a half inch flute or like a three quarter inch flute, but I didn't want to have to machine all that extra material out. And I also didn't want to have to do an extra tool change. So I'm just going to go ahead and stick with my quarter inch ball end mill and do one thirty second of an inch step overs and we'll see how that looks. We don't need any stock to leave, any fillets, smoothing or anything like that. And yep, it's cutting both ways in both directions. So we're good. Let's see what that looks like. It might take a second to load. Okay. So let's take a look here. Yes, it is coming around and it is touching all the surfaces that I want. And it's not really breaching into here. Now it kind of looks weird right here. Although it is clipping into that right there, so that might be something we need to look at. Um, but everything else looks good, so let's simulate it real quick, make sure there's no other problems, and maybe we can come back and address that. So let's simulate the whole operation. Let's take a look at what we have. Our total machining time is an hour and 30 minutes. Um, that is a bit long, and I, I suspect probably an hour of that is that ball end mill. So we probably can come back and update that. Okay, so we clear out the pockets, we clean up the pockets, then we do a um, 2D contour, and we cut the neck pocket and clean it up. Then we rough out the ridges. And now the scallop tool path is going to go on the top, come down on the bottom, come around the top. You'll see it here in a second. So it's working its way from the outside in. And one cool thing about that, as you can see, it's shrinking from here to here, is that actually helps eliminate tear out as well. So 
sometimes if you're if you're going back and forth between cross cutting and um, rip cutting with your end mill, sometimes you can get little flakes that kind of just rip off. And if you have really fine details, that can be a problem. One nice thing is by working from the outside in, you're basically eliminating any chance of that. It's another reason why I like the scallop tool path. So let's hide our bodies. Everything is turning green. Then it's going to finish up on the right side. Yes, and everything looks good. We've got that entire front machined. And as far as this is concerned, it's not machining this. It is leaving this little wisp here, which is kind of weird. Um, I'm not too concerned about that, though. But I'm actually pretty happy with that, so I don't think I'm going to touch it. So let's go ahead, come back. Okay, there we go. So we have programmed the entire top of that. One thing I am going to do, I am going to up that step over just a little bit because that is pretty large. So let's do 0 0.05. Let's do a sixteenth of an inch and see what that looks like. Might take a second to load. That still looks pretty good. Let's simulate just that portion real quick and see if it gives us any decent surface quality. Let's just skip to the end here. It's trying to catch up to itself. Okay. So let's hide our bodies. And let's change this material. See. Let's change this to material instead of comparison. And let's do mirror. So this will give you an idea of the rough surface quality. Um, like if this was machined in metal, right? Now in wood, all of this is going to be very easy to sand out. Um, but in metal, that would obviously not be ideal. So I think I am going to take it back and just suffer through the long machining time because that looks pretty, pretty rough. Let's go back. Go 0 0.03125. Load it one more time and we'll take a look at that again. Apologize for the wait. Okay. Let's just skip to the end. Come on. Yeah, you can see this little red bar is loading. Okay. So yeah, that's a much, much finer detail. And it does leave little cusps, which you will notice like a slight texture to the surface, but those are so small that you're not really ever going to notice. So just a little bit of sanding will definitely clean all of that up. So I'm pretty happy with that. So let's go ahead and move on to the backside. First of all, let's change this back to comparison. And let's go ahead and move on to the backside and flip the, flip the part over. Okay, so for the backside, it's going to be a little bit different. We have to create a new setup. Um, we'll actually just duplicate this setup and make some changes. But one critical change is that my fixture is going to be on the other side. So I have a second fixture here. Let me show the stock. I have a second fixture here that sits on top. So essentially, if I flipped this over, then my stock would look like this. So even though from this orientation, it looks like there's two, basically this one would be hidden because this is what it would look like when it's flipped over. So now we can actually just machine from this side. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this and duplicate it, the setup that we just did. And let's go duplicate. And then we need to make a few changes in the setup. So edit. And fixture is currently selecting the one on the top. We need to change that to the one on the bottom. Our stock is still the same stock, so we don't have to change anything there. And our models are still the same. 
So that's really all we needed to change. Actually, no, there's one more thing, very important actually, is the origin point. So the origin point is still located on the bottom left corner of the other stock. We need to reorient it to this one. So let's go x-axis is here, y-axis is here, and then we'll change our origin point to here. And so yes, x is going that way, y is going that way, and z is going up. So I'm happy with that. Hit OK. And it was that simple. We already have our setup with the part flipped. So we actually didn't flip the part. What we ended up doing was flipping the setup. Um, just putting the origin point on the other side and I just made a duplicate fixture and um, joint it to the other side. So that's fine. Now let's pull this up. Let's regenerate these tool paths because some of these might already apply. You'd be surprised because it's basically the same geometry minus a few changes. So one thing we know we don't need is the, um, those pockets for the uh, pickups. So we can just delete that one. We don't need the cleaning up one for those pockets either. We do want this contour for the outside, which we might have to make some small changes to. We don't need the adaptive for the neck pocket, so we can just delete that. And we don't need the cleanup for the neck pocket either. We do want the roughing strategy for that, and we want the finishing scallop strategy. So you can see that it loaded a bunch more, so we have to make a couple changes here. So let's go to our 2D contour and hit edit. Let's go to our geometry. It's still using that as the contour selection. And But what we want to do is right now it's going from stock top minus... Actually, that's correct. Let's see. Yeah, that's actually still fine. I'm going to change that a little bit. Negative 0.75. Yes, I think we're fine. Let's see what that looks like. So it's actually cutting into the top, so we have a problem. Go back to edit. And selected contours. Oh, I see. It's flipped to the inside right here. So we just need to hit this little red arrow to cut to the outside of that line. Let's hit OK. See what happens. Yes, we are good now. So we can come in, cut, cut the contour, then clear our adaptive. Let's see if we need to make any changes here. So let's just simulate this and see what it looks like. That's going to be easier. Okay. Okay, so we do have some error messages. Rapid collision with stock. We'll address those in a minute. Okay, so it's cutting around just fine. Speed it up a little bit. It does look like we need to make a few changes to the roughing strategy. Also, I think I need to turn off uh, some of these effects here. There we go. It's too dark. Okay, yeah, you can see here too, it's getting some real funky shapes with this back pocket, so we need to update that. Look at our bodies. And then the scallop looks pretty good, actually. So let's go to... Adaptive, edit, come back in here. So let's go ahead and take off this contour. We just need it to machine anywhere inside this contour. And then what's our top to bottom look like? Negative 0.75, that looks about right. Passes, and then machining cavities is turned off. Stock to leave. That looks good to me. Let's take another look. Yes, that's already looking better. You can just tell by the toolpath. Let's simulate this. 
It's definitely looking better already. We don't have any more error messages on that program, so that definitely was the problem. Okay, just checking something. Okay, so that's good. And then our scallop. There definitely is a problem here. You can see that it's machining the top face. That's because we had the other one avoiding that surface. So we just need to come in and change that real quick. So delete these surfaces. We want to avoid this surface and this surface and these bottom surfaces here. And let's see. We want to avoid that surface as well. And let's check in here. That all looks good. Let's see what changed. Okay, that's looking much better, although it is ramping down into these holes, I can already tell, so that's kind of a problem. Everything else looks really good, though. And so we're already almost done. Just by duplicate, we did most of the work on the first side. Um, oh, it is also cutting into these ferrule holes, so we'll want to change that. So let's add to the avoid surfaces, which is these holes right here, like that. And let's avoid these sidewalls of these as well, because I think that's what it's actually trying to machine are these sidewalls. And let's take a look at that and see if anything changed. Apologize for the loading times. It's one of the most frustrating things about CAM, actually. <laughs> okay, good. So it's no longer cutting these. It is no longer... It's no longer cutting that pocket, and it's no longer cutting these, although it is working its way around it. So it's not exactly ideal, um, but that's not bad. So let's simulate this whole program. And then all we'll have left to do, if this is good, all we'll have left to do is just some bore out some of the holes for the ferrules and clean up this little back pocket right here. Let's start at the beginning. Okay, so it's doing its 2D contour. Now it's doing the roughing strategy. And now it's scalloping up and everything should be turning green. Let's check real quick. Okay, I do want to check these right here real quick because it does look like it is leaving some of the steps, but that's okay because we can come back in and bore those out in a moment. That might, that might look a little weird for now. Yes, this is looking good. So let's just go ahead and bore out this, these pockets and clean that up and cut in our ferrule holes. So that's going to be real easy. All the hard work is done. So bring back our bodies and hide that. So let's do a 2D boring operation and we're going to select our flat end mill quarter inch flat end mill this one actually geometry and then we'll select these holes and we will select these holes and then let's go ahead and do Heights, we don't want to go to whole bottom. What we want to do is go from stock top. Um, because that way, if we went from whole bottom, it's just going to start at the top of the hole, but this is on a tapered surface, and so that might give us some weird results. So, yes, we're good there. Top height. Sorry, bottom height is whole bottom. But whole top... And Sorry, top height is stock top. And actually, we're going to have to do these ones in a separate operation because they have a different Z height. 
So here you can see the difference. So this is, let's see. Let's do selection down to that surface and should be from stock top. Oh man, I just realized what was going on. I was in back in my old setup and that's why it's trying to cut from the other side. So let's hit cancel. Let's come back in here and delete. Okay, yeah, we didn't end up adding that boring operation. So I need to come back into here where our setup is flipped and then apply the boring operation. That's what was going on. So let's do quarter inch ball end mill, or not ball, flat end mill. Hit OK. And then we want to choose these features. Let's see if we can do it all in one. Like that. And then we can go order by depth. Actually, we don't want to order by depth. We want to order by hole. So then we can go bottom height is whole bottom. And then top height is not whole top, it's stock top. So this is what it kind of looks like. So if I do whole top, it's going to start at the top of each one of these holes. But that might not be ideal depending on how you've cleared out the material ahead of time. So I'm actually just going to do stock top. That way it extends that tool path all the way to the top of the stock and it'll just ramp down. And we don't need any multiple passes. Actually, we might. Let's see what happens. Yes, yeah, so on these ones, it's going to leave a little cylinder in the middle. But these ones are going to be fine. So let's split these into two separate operations. So let's unselect these ones. Just hit OK, and that'll be it for the ferrule holes. And then we will just duplicate this one. Duplicate. Come on. And then in here, we'll just change our geometry from the ferrule holes to these ones. And everything else should apply the same. Hit OK. And then what we need to do is come in and apply a couple finishing passes. So we'll do passes, multiple passes, and we'll do a eighth of an inch step over so it's going to cut one and then come around and cut the rest so that way it cuts the entire profile. That works for me. Hit OK. Alright, last thing that we need to do, actually there's two more cuts that we need to do. We need to clear out the pocket for the control cavity and then we need to cut, a li or cut our tabs so that way we break our parts free. So let's go ahead and do a 2D adaptive clearing. What we're going to do is we're going to use our flat end mill. We're good there. The pocket selection is this one right here. Our bottom height is the selected contours. And then passes. We don't want any stock to leave. And we could probably do that all in multiple depths. It is a quarter of an inch though, so that's a, that's a pretty hefty load. So let's go ahead and do two passes at an eighth of an inch each. Optimal load is 0.1. We want to be able to cut both ways. Hit OK. Let's see. Yeah, so it's doing two right there. OK. So we only have one last thing to do, and we need to cut we need to cut our tabs. So let's do 2D contour. And we're actually let's cancel that. Let's grab this one and let's duplicate it. So let's duplicate. Let's drag it to the bottom. Okay, go edit. In this case, we don't need multiple depths because all the material has been cleared out already. So let's take off multiple depths. And then the height, we still want to, let's see, 
So we went 0.75, and on the other side we went 0.75, which leaves about an eighth of an inch material here. So we need to cut an eighth of an inch deeper, but leave an eighth of an inch tab. So let's go ahead and do negative, oh, negative 0.875 inches. So it cuts an eighth of an inch deeper. Then on here, let's go ahead and hit tabs. And you see it's going to automatically try to apply a bunch of tabs. Now you might not want that many tabs, and that's a lot to clean up. So we can just uh, increase the tool distance, or not tool distance, tab distance, until we're satisfied. Or if you want to have tabs in a particular area, you can come here and say at points, and like maybe I want to have it at this point and this point, right? So you can specify if you want. I'm just going to do by distance. And I'm going to leave myself, let's add a little, that looks pretty good. That's not terrible, and that would be fairly easy to clean up. And good, it's not applying anything on the front here, so that's fine. And then, that should be good. Let's see what it looks like. Okay. So let's go ahead and simulate that real quick. And then we can simulate the entire thing because we are basically done. That went way too fast. Okay. No, that's fine. We can just skip through it. Okay, so it is cutting through and leaving a slight little tab here. I'm pretty happy with that. And so basically at that point, we can just take the whole part off cut off those tabs and you know kind of just pare them away with a chisel or sand them off etc not much really left to do so i'm pretty happy with that i don't know what do you guys think so let's just go ahead and simulate all of our setups so we understand what we told every everything to do so let's bring back our original fixture and our body on this side so we've got a fixture and we're going to zero it from this corner and zero it on the top here. And then we've got this setup. So let's simulate. Let's hide our laminated top because at this point we don't have a laminated top. And it's just going to machine some of these early pockets. Or not pockets, these little uh, wiring raceways. And then it's going to machine out most of the control cavity. With a flat end mill all the way down into that little recess, which we then machined off later. So now we can go back and let's simulate this setup. Now this setup hat is still on the front, but it has the laminated top. So we then fully machine out the pickup slots. Let's speed it up a little bit. And then we do our contour, and then we do our pocket and clean that up. And then we do our 3D roughing strategy. And then we come in with a scallop and a ball end mill and fine tune those surfaces so that they're really nice and smooth. And we didn't go all the way through the material because we we're going to leave tabs at the center. So what we're, what we're actually left with at the end is just the majority of the body carved out, but we can still flip it over and have all that material on the other side. So let's close that out, and then let's simulate our flipped setup. So let's bring back our other fixture. So now we're flipping the part over, and we have our laminated top, and let's simulate this. Slow it down a bit. We do have some error messages. I will clean those up before I actually go make this. But let's see. Okay, so we're doing the contour. Oh, now we're doing the 3D strategy. Ah, that's what happened. So we did make a mistake. We accidentally dragged both of our contours down to the bottom. So let's drag that first one up to the top. 
So we come around first, then do our adaptive, and the last one is a contour just to give ourselves some tabs. So let's simulate this one more time. I apologize. This is the importance of simulation because this is where you figure out whether or not there's problems in your setup. So, yes, so we are now cutting the contour. And, yeah, there we go. Okay, and then we're switching to our 3D adaptive strategy to clear out most of the waste material. And then we're switching to our ball end mill to scallop everything. In hindsight, actually what I probably should do is take the, the boring operations and move them before the scallop. That way all of that is cleared out ahead of time. So then it's going to bore out those holes. In a second. Yep. It's going to bore out all those holes, clear them out. And then it's going to machine this in two passes and bring it down to the surface we machined earlier. And then cut around the contour and break our part free. So that is our finished guitar body on both sides. All right. Well, wow. That was a long, long episode. So everybody who stayed with me through this entire thing, I really appreciate it. Um, cam can take quite a while, but it's, it's one of those portions of the program where you really need to pay attention to the fine details. And those fine details are where you can really slip up and give yourself headaches. So originally I was just going to post a video of how I programmed it, just giving you a snapshot, but Really, I figured you guys wanted to see the really nitty gritty details of, you know, which features, which, um, which buttons I pushed, you know, to get the results I needed. And so I, even though this video is long, I hope it guy, gave you guys the information you were looking for, and I hope it helps you build better guitars. So let me know if you guys want to see more content like this. I am planning on having one more video in this cam series focused on machining a neck, um, the matching neck that goes with this guitar. So that will be out in the next couple weeks. So look forward to that. Um, but if you guys want more cam tutorials or more really in-depth um, start to finish tutorials like this one, let me know down in the comments and I'd be happy to, to do that. So if you guys didn't know, you guys can submit requests for my channel. Um, I have a Discord server that's very active. A lot of people have been talking on it, and we, we have great conversations about CAD models and as well as just have a little bit of fun. Um, and you can also uh, submit requests via email. So both of those will also be in the description down below. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the next episode. So thank you, and I'm signing out. Cheers.